Um, so I want to say a little bit about sex and sexual differentiation. And then I'll talk a bit about the genes that um, are involved in determining sex and its influence on gender. And then I'll say something about sex chromosomes, which as I said, are very weird. Um, particularly concentrating on the Y chromosome and its eminent design, uh, its uh, reduction and subsequent loss, and finish up talking about the future of human sex. And a uh, background to all of this is how valuable it's been for me to look at really, really weird animals. And Australia is the place for weird animals. So I've been very fortunate to work with some really amazing animals. So why do we have sex? Sex has been described as the, the, the best invention of biology. But in fact, it really doesn't make a lot of sense because if... Uh, if you share your parentage of your offspring with somebody else, you're diluting your own genes. And it might be really a lot better if you cloned yourself, you'd pass all your genes on to your offspring. So your genes would do better if you, you're cloned, you cloned yourself. And in fact, some animals do that. And this is the little lizard that is a pathogenetic uh, lizard, it's female only, and females make eggs out of their own genes. So what's, why do we have sex? It doesn't really make evolutionary sense. Uh, so you're forced to think, well, what is the good thing about sex? It's mixing up genes. And this little cartoon will show you why that's a good thing. So let's say here's a primitive giraffe with short legs and short neck and can't reach the uh, foliage on which it grazes um, and then after many many millions of years you get a long-legged mutant and it still can't reach the leaves or, and you also get a long-necked mutant and it can't reach the leaves either what you'd like to do is combine those characters and get a giraffe which is tall enough now to reach the leaves. So it's a very good thing to be able to combine genes and not have to wait for mutation to do its job all over again. And so this is what people think that the whole point of sex is to mix up those genes um, and create new combinations, which might be particularly successful in new niches and particularly might be very successful in confusing the pathogens because you're always making new combinations of surface antigens that the pathogens um, can't uh, easily infect. So we're, we're pretty sure that that's the whole point of sex is to mix up those genes. Well, um, it's pretty much ubiquitous in all animals, um, almost anyway. And the whole point of it is to make gametes, that is the haploid sperm and eggs, and combine those genes. But when you look at the panoply of sex, it's just amazing the sex differences you see between males and females. Birds are a wonderful example where you get very flamboyant, different colorations. But if you look at invertebrates, you can often find amazing sex differences like these ticks. The male is essentially a little orange parasite on the female. Uh, so I'm going, to con I'm going to confine myself to talking about vertebrates today, uh, though invertebrates are probably just as interesting. And I'll start off by just uh, reminding you how vertebrates are related to each other. So my whole career has really been based on looking at the chromosomes, looking at the genes and the DNA sequence of all kinds of different animals and comparing them to figure out what happened, when, how did it evolve, and that in turn tells us a lot about how it works. Um, so of course most people work on humans and mice because that's where the money is, let's face it. Um, you know, there aren't too many granting agencies that will uh, put a lot of money into kangaroos or platypuses, however interesting they are. Uh, but my lab is the weird mammal lab. So we did a lot of work with elephants. And the reason for that is elephants are just about as far away, evolutionarily speaking. We last shared a common ancestor with an elephant about 105 million years ago. So if you compare elephants and humans, you're looking back about 105 million years. 
And we can also look at marsupial mammals. Uh, that's a different uh, sub, uh, category of mammals. And now we're looking back 148 million years. And we can go back even further by looking at egg-laying mammals. That's some monotremes like platypus. Uh, now we're looking back 166 million years. And by comparing these, we can figure out uh, what happened when and how that changes the function. Well, I thought well, that was probably enough for one career, but some of very adventurous students of mine convinced we, we should look at reptiles and birds. Um, and so we've done a lot of work lately on particularly the dragon lizard, which is uh, that beautiful little creature up on the, the left-hand side. Uh, and there's a lot of work done now on frogs and fish. I won't be telling you a lot about those today. So we have a huge amount of variation within vertebrates and a huge opportunity to compare and go back in time. Well, the methods I've used are, are really kind of old fashioned now, but they really work. That is to look down the microscope and see sex chromosomes. And these are kangaroo chromosomes. They're so pretty, they actually made a postage stamp out of them. Um, they're very large and very few of them. So they've been a dream to work on. So what we've done is to, um, to do a lot of molecular work, to isolate particular genes, tag them in different colors, and you can actually see where those genes are. And if they're on sex chromosomes, you can see whether they're female specific or male specific. We also have a technique where we can actually physically sort the chromosomes by size and DNA content and tag them with different colors. This is called chromosome painting. And that's the only way we could actually tell who was who with platypus chromosomes, which are kind of horrible to look at. But even better, you can take the sorted chromosomes from one species and paint them onto another species and directly look at homology between different species. So here, for instance, we've used paints from one kind of wallaby onto another kind of wallaby, which has absolutely huge chromosomes. And you can see these huge chromosomes are just the, the smaller chromosomes all jammed together. So we get a very quick look at the, uh, at the evolution of the genome this way. Well, of course, since then, we've done a lot of DNA sequencing. We were actually very early adopters of DNA sequencing. We first sequenced the opossum in 2007, and we've done many, many marsupials since then, and the platypus has been done once or twice. So now, particularly now, we have long-range sequencing. We're able to get a very, very good uh, assembly of the uh, DNA sequence of sex chromosomes, and that's completely changed changing the picture. Uh, of course, a reminder of sex determination. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, this is actually a, um, a mouse embryo, but it looks pretty much the same for fish, birds, and just about everything. The genital ridge is just a little ridge of cells on top of the embryonic kidney, but it's unique in that it's able to form two totally different structures according to the uh, instructions it gets. It can either form a testis or an ovary. And so that's very unique that you get two uh, very different structures from the same uh, uh, the, the same ridge of cells. The germ cells have a completely different um, uh, origin and they actually migrate into the genital ridge. But the genital ridge is really where the action is. So obviously there's a trigger that tells you which way to go, left or right, testis or ovary. And that trigger can be different in different vertebrates. So the trigger can be genetic, uh, and it can either be a male determining factor or a female determining factor, or it could even be environmental. And there are a lot of reptiles, for instance, that use temperature to determine whether you're a male or female. And I won't be talking about that in this lecture, but that's a really interesting new uh, uh, field that we, we're looking at, the environment and genetic interaction. Uh, well, in humans and in other uh, mammals, you get uh, the positive 
trigger is a male determining factor, which is called the testis determining factor or TDF. And so obviously we'd like to know what that is and how it works. Uh, so we know where it is, because if you look at the chromosomes of a female and a male, you can uh, cut them all out and line them all up. And you find in female, uh, there's a pair of each. And that makes sense because one set comes from mother, the other set comes from father. Uh, but if you do the same thing with a male human, you find they all pair up except one chromosome. And that chromosome is called the X chromosome, not because it looks like an X, but X for unknown, X for weird. Uh, there's two copies in females, only one copy in males. The other really weird thing about males is this little teeny weeny chromosome there, which is called the Y chromosome because it, it mates with the X. So there is a, a major genetic difference between males and females. And we know uh, because uh, we have uh, individuals in the community who have a single X chromosome, but no Y, and they're girls. And we also have people with two X chromosomes, but they also have a Y and they're boys. And so we know that the testis determining factor must be on the Y chromosome. So the Y chromosome may look weird and rather pathetic, but it does contain the testis determining factor. And this was a big deal to look for the testis determining factor in the 80s. This is work I had really nothing to do with until one day um, when uh, it, I was presented with the opportunity of testing out a gene that which was supposedly the testis determining factor. So this work ha had been done over a decade or so, looking at, well, which bit of the Y chromosome uh, does the testis determining factor live in? And so people had looked at um, individuals with deletions of the Y chromosome. And what they found was if, uh, if you had the top bit of the Y chromosome, you were male. But if you had just the bottom bit without the top, you were female. So the test determining factor had to live in the top of the Y. And uh, this gene ZFY had been cloned from the top of the Y and it looked like a real good candidate. Um, now, this is actually what got me into looking at sex determination. So I really love this story. Uh, at the time, um, the, the ZFY uh, looked like a good candidate. Um, David Page sent it to us and said, please map it in kangaroos, because if it is a sex determining factor, it should be on the Y chromosome in kangaroos. So I got two of my students, Andrew Sinclair um, and Jamie Foster, on the job of mapping this gene in kangaroos. And they called me up at midnight and said, it's not on the Y chromosome, it's on chromosome five. And that's a very weird place for a sex determining gene. Um, and I, I said, well, you know, you might get a little note somewhere about this gene, it'll be on the Y. wasn't on the Y, so they got a cover story in Nature out of it. And uh, it was obviously the wrong gene. Andrew Sinclair went to work with Peter Goodfellow in London, and it was he who cloned SRY, which is the right gene. Uh, and Jamie Foster, who was, uh, he, it was actually his first week in the lab when they discovered the ZFY is the wrong gene, he went off to London as well. And uh, it was he who discovered the ancestor of SRY. Again, by looking in kangaroos, we found it had um, a partner on the X chromosome that nobody had seen. And also another similar gene that was the target of SRY. So this was a huge advance because we knew absolutely nothing except that there was some gene somewhere. And now we know that SRY is the right gene. It turns on other genes. Uh, and we know a little bit about where it came from. Well, we thought innocently back in the 90s that we'd solved the whole problem, that the whole uh, pathway of making a testis would now become very clear. Now we had this gene. 
We thought, well, maybe there might be a few genes downstream of SRY, probably turns on something else, and that turns on something else, and that makes the testes, and maybe there are a few upstream genes as well. Um, it turns out to be way more complicated than this. Uh, this is a rather old slide, uh, which shows that uh, the, there are two pathways. SRY looks like... Huh, SRY uh, looks like it's kind of in the middle of things. If there's SRY, it, what it does is turn on SOX9, and SOX9 is a very conserved sex determining gene, and it does uh, it it is very influential in uh, getting other genes to make a testis. Without SRY, you can see that other genes are now making beta catenin, um, and that's pushing towards an ovary. But you can also see that there's a lot of interaction between the, the testis and the ovary determining pathways. So there's, there's some genes that are inhibiting testis genes and some genes that are inhibiting ovary genes and some genes that are actually inhibiting inhibitors. So it's a real push me, pull you. And you can see that it's a complex pathway with a lot of checks and balances in it. And I always say, well, it's really a pathway like this. We probably only have a very superficial understanding of it, but there's also all these little balls that are running around. And if they end up in the genital ridge, you have a testis. And if they get destroyed in one way or another, uh, you don't get it and you end up with an ovary. So it's, it's quite a complicated pathway. So... Any complicated pathway, of course, you're going to get a lot of variation between people or between mice in uh, the strength of one gene and another gene. There's a delicate balance. So there is a lot of variation in sex determination. And you probably know enough to realize that there's a lot of people who uh, have some, some kind of uh, untypical uh, sex determination, either intersex or uh, Male determination or female determination and infertility. Uh, so that's not the end of it. There's variation at every point. Uh, the uh, Once a testis is made or an ovary is made, uh, it makes very powerful hormones, androgens or estrogens, and there's a lot of variations in those pathways as well. So there's uh, enzymes that can do all these conversions between different androgens and estrogen, and there's variation in the amounts and, and uh, the interaction of those hormones. And, and so not surprisingly, if you look at the physical development, uh, so males and females obviously have much the same body plan, and most people simply look at um, the gonads and the genitals and the gametes, or maybe breast development, but there's uh, differences at every level. So if you look at the uh, transcriptome of males and females, it's something like a third of the genes are differentially expressed. A third of your 20,000 genes are different, differently expressed in males and females. And that's not just in the gonads or the breasts, um, that's also in the spleen and the liver and the brain. And we simply don't understand quite why there are these differences, but presumably they've been either selected uh, for uh, because of different requirements of males or females. So it's much more uh, it's much more profound than people have really given it credit for. Well, uh, physical development of sex is just one thing. Gender identity is very much in the news these days. Uh, and we know, we've always known that there are people who were born typical males, but who've always felt themselves female and the reverse. And we've known for a very long time that this is the case. Uh, there's now a lot of work suggesting that there is a whole lot of genes that are involved in gender identity that are not necessarily linked to, uh, to sex determination. So there's just beginning to be a lot of work looking for genes um, which are uh, variant in um, trans men and trans women. And I'll bet you there's going to be uh, uh, um, probably tens or hundreds of genes that have major effects on femininity or masculinity. Uh, it's the same thing for mate preference. 
we know that uh, most males prefer females, but some males prefer males. And again, there's a wide variation. And again, I will bet you anything that there are genes involved in mate choice. Mate choice is one of the most heavily selected uh, characteristics in fruit flies. And so why should humans be any different? And again, I think it's clear that there are many genes that are involved in mate choice, which are not linked to sex determination. So again, I will bet you that there are many, many gay genes that we don't really know about. So for an evolutionary geneticist, it's absolutely not surprising at all that we have variation in sexual development, variation in gender, variation in mate preference. Uh, the only surprising thing is how very frequent it is. And what I'm suggesting here, and I have suggested before, is that these, are, uh, these genes are typical sexually antagonistic genes. So for instance, a gay man may have uh, male loving genes, which are an advantage to his sisters and, and aunts because um, she will mate earlier and have more kids. Uh, uh, so you can see why it would be a selected gene in the opposite sex. So I think this is probably what's happening both in gender identity and in, in mate preference is a typical sexual antagonistic uh, that you have a uh, more babies conceived in one sex than the other. Well, I want to talk about chromosomes now because sex chromosomes are really weird. And that's why cytologists have always liked sex chromosomes because they are so atypical in so many ways. So the X chromosome looks like a perfectly ordinary chromosome. So let's talk about the X chromosome. Looks quite normal. It's big. Um, it has something like a thousand genes on it. And these genes do all sorts of things. You know, there's uh, pigment genes, there, there's uh, blood protein genes, there's household enzyme genes. It doesn't look like it's particularly, uh, uh, it's, it doesn't look like a, a chromosome that is particularly involved in sex. Um, and so the models that we consider, well, first of all, that uh, this, uh, this, X chromosome is just an ordinary chromosome. It's just as sweet as, as the other chromosomes. Um, but an early possibility was that, no, it's actually a chromosome with a lot of genes on it that control other genes. Now, I don't actually think that's played out, but what has is this is a very smart chromosome. There are way too many genes on it that are expressed in the brain. And when they're mutated, you get um, X-linked uh, mental retardation. Uh, there's about five times more than you would expect by chance. And the other thing is that there's way more genes on it that are involved in gonads and um, fertility than you would expect by chance. So the X, although it looks quite normal, is not really a normal chromosome. It seems to have been selected for a high frequency of uh, in intelligence and sex related genes. And the funny thing is some of these are the same genes. I call the brains and balls genes because they're expressed in the testis and in the brain. And they seem to be, uh, have been selected perhaps in two different ways. So a lot of these are multifunctional proteins. Um, and it, I think they've been selected for, because they can, uh, they have a male advantage in a single dose. And also uh, because they are functioning directly in uh, reproduction. So that's my preferred model of the sex uh, of the X chromosome. It's a, a smart and sexy chromosome. Well, what about the Y chromosome? It's a very pathetic little chromosome. It looks weird and it is weird. It's mostly repetitive sequences. Um, there are only 27 genes that are on the Y chromosome in the region that is male specific. Uh, yeah. Now there are many copies of some of these genes because gene amplification occurs very frequently on the Y chromosome, but mostly these are inactive. So you have a wasteland of pseudogenes and very few protein 
uh, coding genes on the Y chromosome. Um, so how does that fit with our models of the Y? This is the model we all grew up with, it, the, the little Y chromosome was a macho little thing, but we now know that's only because it has the SIY gene on it. Uh, another theory was it is a selfish chromosome because it grabs genes from other parts of the genome, which are useful in males. And that's the way the Drosophila Y chromosome has been evolved. Uh, but that's not really what we observe in humans. There are only three or four genes on the Y chromosome, which have an advantage in males, which came from autosomes. But there, there are a few, but mostly they're not. Mostly the genes genes on the Y chromosome um, have partners on the X from which they evolved. And so my last cartoon was that the Y chromosome is really a bit of a wimp. It's really just a degenerated X chromosome. And I'll show you the evidence for that. Uh, so you've got to ask, well, why are sex chromosomes so, so weird? Particularly why is a Y chromosome so weird? Uh, is it so it works better or is it uh, the result of some horrible uh, evolutionary accident? And I am here to tell you, they don't work very well. You have all sorts of problems because there's two X chromosomes, two copies in females and only one in males. That's clearly not fair because there's a thousand genes you have to worry about. So you have a very elaborate system for turning down one X chromosome in females. Um, it's also uh, doesn't work very well because they don't pair very well. They only pair right at the very tips. And if they don't pair, you don't get sperm. Uh, so infertility uh, results from any change in the little bit of the X and the Y that do pair. Uh, so really the answer is you can only understand X and Y chromosomes if by in terms of evolution. And so this little scheme uh, I, I drew up, but it was actually suggested 100 years ago for Drosophila. Uh, so the idea is that once upon a time, the X and Y chromosome were just an ordinary pair of chromosomes going about their ordinary business and recombining in their whole length. The little dotted line there is recombination. Until one day, one partner acquires a new male determining gene. And we think in mammals, that was SRY gene. And then what happened is another gene or more than other genes, male advantage genes accumulate on the Y chromosome. And to keep them all together with the, the SRY gene, you actually suppress recombination between that region of the Y and the X chromosome. So you don't want to disrupt them by recombining them. Um, and what that does is now you've suppressed recombination that's very bad for any part of the genome. So you get all sorts of accidents. You get importation of, of uh, repetitive sequence. You get deletions. You get mutations. And very rapidly, that part of the Y chromosome uh, degenerates. And that degeneration expands and expands very rapidly until you get pretty much uh, what we see today, that is the X of the Y chromosome only pair in the very, very top region where they're homologous. Most of the Y chromosome is degraded and full of pseudogenes, and there are very few active genes left. Uh, now, of course, that isn't the last uh, thing that could happen. You could uh, degrade the Y chromosome even further uh, until they don't pair at all. And that's the way it actually is in marsupials. Uh, and then you could completely lose the Y chromosome. And I'll tell you at the end that this has actually happened in some rodents. So I think there's, it's quite clear that the Y chromosome is a degraded uh, X chromosome. And that has interesting implications to the genes on the Y, because you would expect that they might be uh, evolved from genes that were on the original autosome. And that seems to be the case for at least 20 out of the 27 genes have partners on the X chromosome. And these are just three that we happen to have discovered their X partners. Uh, so the, part, the genes on the Y chromosome seem to have a function in spermatogenesis, but they have copies on the X chromosome, which have much more general 
functions. And even SRY has a copy on the X chromosome. And these genes on the X chromosome are interesting because they're all brains and balls genes. Um, they, they seem to have very uh, major effects, um, both on intelligence and reproduction. Um, now, of course, uh, they're all very interesting evolutionary stories. I'm just going to tell you about uh, SRY itself because we have a very good idea how it evolved from SOX3. SOX3 is a very old gene. You find it in fish and frogs and everything else, but it is not sex determining in mammals. Not usually, but there were babies born that had no SRY, no Y chromosome, and SOX3 actually acts as a sex determining gene if it's accidentally expressed in the bipotential gonad. And so we now have uh, lines of mice also in which this gene is misexpressed and it has become sex determining. So what I suggested happened, and I think is now pretty much agreed, is that uh, what happened was a breakage of, of the um, SOX3 gene and a fusion with a gonad specific promoter, which drives the expression of SOX3 into the bipotential gonad. And that's how you got a SRY. Um, so it turns out that any SOX gene will do this as long as you drive its expression into the gonad. And so what uh, I was amazed at was how easy it is to make a new sex determining gene and totally change the whole sex determination pathway. Well, I'll say a little bit about where our X and Y chromosomes came from, because this is work I did long ago, um, just simply by taking genes which are on the X chromosome in um, humans and mapping them in kangaroos. Uh, and so what we found was all the genes on the, the long arm of the, X, the human X chromosome are on the X chromosome in kangaroos as well. Here's two of them. They're very close together in humans on the X and also very close together in the kangaroo X. But we got a surprise when we looked at genes on the top, on the short arm of the human X, because they are all on chromosome 5, including ZFY. Uh, and so what this suggested, and we got the same results when we use chromosome painting, uh, when we use a kangaroo X chromosome to paint a human uh, cell, it painted just the bottom of the X chromosome. And so what this looked like was that in humans, these two bits are stuck together, but in kangaroos, they're apart. Now, which was ancestral, that's easy. We simply mapped them in chicken and found all the green genes were on chromosome one, all the, um, all the blue genes are on chromosome four. So that's obviously two blocks that are very, very old that got put together really rather recently. And it's interesting that when we looked at elephants, we found exactly the same genes in the same order. Um, so the green gene was stuck, uh, the green genes were stuck to the blue genes at the centromere. So we think probably you just had a, a centromeric fusion, which is very common, which dumped a bit of an autosome on both the X and the Y chromosome. So what this means is that um, our sex chromosomes actually uh, came from two different blocks, ancestral blocks of genes that got stuck together. Now, the really interesting thing was when we looked at the Y chromosome, we found there's hardly any blue genes left. There are only four blue genes that came from the ancient X chromosome. Practically, our whole Y chromosome comes from this added bit uh, that was added really rather recently, probably about 105 million years ago or so. So that was a, a, a big surprise to everyone that our sex chromosomes came from two ordinary autosomes that just got jammed together. Uh, well, as Art said, we also looked at platypus. We thought we could go back in time a little bit further. And uh, so we looked at sex chromosomes in platypus. We looked at females. I mean, all you have to do to find sex chromosomes is compare females and males. There should be one heteromorphic pair in either one sex or the other. Uh, and so we looked at, at females. Yes, everything's paired. But when we looked at males, we found not two chromosomes that were not paired, but 10. 
And we said, well, that don't be ridiculous. You can't have 10 sex chromosomes, but we use chromosome painting to show, yes, indeed, we have five X chromosomes and five Y chromosomes, and they're all different. So this is a crazy way to do sex. I mean, how's a poor little baby platypus supposed to find out if it's supposed to be male or female, if it gets, say, three Xs and two Ys or vice versa? Um, <laughs> So you've got to explain, well, how on earth does this work? It works because um, the chromosomes all pair at one end or the other and form a chain at meiosis in the order of X1, Y1, X2, Y2, all um, recombining together. And so they form a chain and all the X chromosomes go to one pole and all the Y chromosomes go to another pole. So you only get two kinds of sperm, X-bearing sperm and Y-bearing sperm. So it all works. It's a crazy way of doing it, but evolution doesn't care about that as long as it works. Uh, and it, it does indeed work. Uh, but we were very curious, well, how does this relate to human sex chromosomes and kangaroo sex chromosomes? Well, the answer is it doesn't. Uh, so when we uh, mapped the genes to the X's and the Y's, uh, we found there's no homology at all with human sex chromosomes, none. But the really weird thing was there was a lot of homology to bird sex chromosomes. And the, all those green genes there are actually on the bird sex chromosomes. The other ones are just autosomes. And so we think what happened is that our original um, sex chromosome pair got translocated by an autosome and then another autosome and then another autosome. And so now you have this bizarre system. So essentially, platypus is a furry bird as far as its sex determining system goes. Uh, well, there's no SRY. And in fact, SOX3 is on an autosome. So it seems to be a completely different sex chromosome system. Um, and it looks like the best candidate is a gene called the um, anti-malarian hormone gene, uh, which is actually sex chromosome, uh, sex determining in some fish and reptiles. So it looks like it's a completely different system. It's different from birds. It's different from mammals. It just went its own sweet way. Well, what about birds? We know quite a bit about bird sex determination because they have perfectly good sex chromosomes. They're just completely the other way around from humans. So it's actually the males that have two copies of a large gene-rich chromosome, which we call the Z. Well, we call it Z in Australia, you call it Z. Uh, and there's only one Z chromosome in females and a little pathetic W chromosome with hardly any genes on it. So it's quite the other way around. And the neat thing is that we actually do have some birds that represent a very early stage of differentiation. And that is the flightless emu, which is a big bird, very intimidating. Uh, and it has uh, W and Z chromosomes. Uh, and the Z chromosome is identical to that of the chicken and the zebra finch and everything else. Uh, but the W chromosome is almost as big as the Z. And it's just one little part that seems to have a whole lot of junk DNA in it. So we think what's happened is that, uh, again, you had an autosome originally, and the W chromosome has accumulated female-specific genes and has degenerated because it's lost recombination with the Z chromosome. And now, there's no SRY in a bird, so how does sex work? It looks like another gene entirely called DMRT1 works because it's on the Z chromosome, but there's no copy on the W. So it looks like it's dosage, two copies of that gene and you're male, a single copy and you're female. And so again, probably what happened originally was a simple mutation, a knockout mutation that occurred on one of these chromosomes, and that made a null mutant, which set up dosage. So again, how extremely easy it is to make new sex chromosomes. Well, snakes are interesting too. They have uh, sex chromosomes much like birds. They look the same. They're actually completely different. 
Uh, they are not homologous at all to bird sex chromosomes. So it looks like they independently evolved. We look, um, as, as Art mentioned, I'm sort of slithering down the evolutionary pole and we now look at lizards. Uh, we have a beautiful dragon lizard system, but it has horrible chromosomes. All these sort of teeny weeny chromosomes, you really can't deal with cytologically. But we have our tricks and we're able to show that the two of these little teeny weeny chromosomes are a Z and W chromosome. Uh, and so we were very keen to find out what genes were on the Z and the W, what gene does sex in this species. Uh, so we have a lot of repetitive sequence, which uh, is female specific. So it's on the W chromosome, uh, but we're also able to get sequence from the Z and the W chromosome. And there was a red hot candidate in the stereogenic factor SF1, which is involved in sex with just about everything. And you can see from the map here that uh, that gene is on both the Z and the W chromosome. And we think that's our best candidate. Well, how does it work? Because it's on both sex chromosomes, so how could it possibly work? The really weird thing is when you look at the transcriptome, uh, there's ZZ animals, um, there's two transcripts, but they both make perfectly good uh, protein, which has got a DNA binding domain and a ligand binding domain, no problems. But when you look at the ZW animals, you find that there are those two, but as well, there's 18 different transcripts that are all truncated. So they're all quite crazy and they make truncated uh, product, which has a DNA binding domain, but no ligand binding domain. And we think that's actually inhibiting the SF1. And so in a female, you don't get SF1, and in a male, you do. So we think probably this is uh, what happens. You have these two sex chromosomes. You can tell them apart just by looking at them. Uh, but And you have exactly the same gene identical genomically, the identical sequence, but they have a different conformation and the splicing is altered such that you get sensible uh, splice, sensible transcript from the Z chromosome, but crazy transcripts from the W chromosome. And what happens is you get products which are a real mess in females and you're actually turning off the target gene, whatever it is. So this is yet another way of, of doing sex determination, not even mutating the gene itself. Um, well, there are lots of other ways of doing sex, and one of my favourite is in a fish uh, where you have DMRT1, again, is the sex-determining gene, but it's, uh, it's uh, turned off by methylation. And we know that because if you heat the, the fish up, you get these pseudo males that have a ZW uh, female, uh, a female um, sex chromosome, uh, but it's not female, they, de they develop as males. And it turns out that there's methylation at the, of the DMRT1 gene. And if you heat it up, the, me the methyl groups all disappear. So you actually can get another kind of dosage as well. So uh, to summarize the ways of making sex determining genes, it's just actually quite easy. You can uh, fuse something like the platypus AMH. Uh, you can have a, a mutant like DMRT1 null in birds. Uh, you can actually make more DMRT1. And I, at, at the meeting that I, and I went to, there was an amplification of that gene, which determines a new Y chromosome. Or you can have an extra copy of it that is either active and um, gives you positive dosage and a new Y chromosome or inactive and you can make a um, female determining gene out of an inhibitor. Um, or you can just have expression changes like um, SOX3 uh, SOX in mammals. Or you can even have epigenetic changes like RSF1 in a dragon. So there's all these different ways of making new sex determining genes. Um, well, you, we now have a lot of sex determining genes and the list goes on and on. Uh, and you can see 
if you look hard, that actually the, a lot of, of common genes turn up again and again. So I've simply color coded them here. And so you can see the DMRT1 has independently become sex determining in uh, fish, uh, two different fishes in, um, in uh, DMRT, in Xenopus and in birds. Uh, but SOX3 has independently become sex determining in others. So it looks like there are genes which are really good at sex. And if you look at uh, our uh, pathway, you can see these genes all over the place. So genes all over the place seem to have taken on a sex determining role in one vertebrate or another. So I think there, uh, there are a whole suite of genes in this pathway that could become sex determining. So it's not that hard to make new sex determining genes. And if you add up all of these things and then look back 400 odd million years, you can see that the original um, chromosomes of our ancestors, uh, different parts of the genome became six sex determining in snakes. Uh, chromosome 5 became sex determining in birds. Chromosome 2 became sex chromosome. Uh, that um, cro one of the little chromosomes with the AMH got dumped onto it and became sex determining in platypus. And good old SOX3 on another microchromosome became SRY. And the, the green bit actually doesn't have any sex determining genes in it, but um, it, it uh, supplies a number of Y genes. So the nice thing about this is we know when it happened. So we know that SIY is actually quite young, uh, probably somewhere like 150 million years old, and that defined new sex chromosomes. So what's going to happen next? Um, the Y chromosome is obviously a shadow of its former self. Uh, and it's still a mystery as to why it degrades. People write books about it. My very simplistic answer is that the poor old Y chromosome is always in a testis. The testis is a dangerous place to be because there's a lot of mitosis and not much repair. So there's a high variation of genes on the Y chromosome because it's always in a testis. And it also, it doesn't recombine with the X. So you can't get two good bits of the Y and put them together like you can with the X. So uh, that's why the Y chromosome will degrade very, very rapidly. And that's true of fruit flies as well as humans. Uh, so what we can say is, well, when will it disappear at this rate? We, we know the rate of loss of genes because 150 million years ago, the Y chromosome was identical to the X or the two bits of the X, which is something like a thousand genes. And today there's only 43 if you count the 27 in the male specific part, plus the bit on the pairing part. Uh, so you can work out that the genes loss, uh, uh, loss at the rate of 6.3 per million years there are only 43 left, so it's easy to calculate at this rate, the Y chromosome is going to disappear in 6.8 million years. And there it goes. And people get terribly upset about this. I, I keep on saying, well, you know, we've only been human for 100,000 years. Do you think we're really going to be around in 6.8 million years? But people are concerned, well, what's going to happen after the Y chromosome disappears? Will, will males disappear? Um, and if males disappear, what happens to the rest of us? Well, we could become pathogenic like the whiptail lizard. Um, that's not going to work very well because we have a number of genes that only work if they come through sperm. So there's these are called imprinted genes where there's some of the work only if they come through the egg and others and at least 30 of them will only work if they come through sperm. So we need men and we need sperm. We're not going to become Amazonian pathogens anytime soon. Um, so our only chance of survival is inventing new sex determining genes. And I want to finish up by just telling you the good news is that that has happened. 
in a, a funny little rat, very endangered rat species, uh, a spiny rat in Japan. There's three species that live on different islands in Japan. And one of them, one of them has a Y chromosome with a hundred copies of SRY that doesn't work very well. The other two have completely lost the Y chromosome and both males and females have a single X chromosome only. So for many, many years, people have looked for what is the new sex determining gene. And just in November, they found it. And here's the data. Uh, they lined up the genomes of males and females looking for absolutely anything in the genome. And they found a tiny little part of the genome which was um, different in all males and all females. Uh, this little part of the genome turned out to be a 17 kilobase duplication that was male specific. And the really interesting thing is it's right upstream from a very important gene, which is SOX9. So it looks like there's uh, been a duplication upstream of SOX9, which happens to be an enhancer sequence. We know that um, it, because uh, the homology with mouse, it looks like duplication of an enhancer upstream of SOX9 turns on SOX9 without SRY. So it's become the new sex determining gene in the spiny rat. So I think there's probably every uh, possibility that there'll be a new uh, kind, a, a new evolution of a new sex gene if we lose our Y chromosomes. So I hope the men in the audience will find some comfort from the spiny rat. It's easy to make new sex genes, and it's it's already happened in spiny rats. So what will happen eventually when the Y chromosome disappears? We'll invent something new. Um, However, is that going to work very well? What happens if a normal XX woman mates with a spiny rat man? Um, well, there's going to be a war of the sex genes. You know, SOX9 will be battling it out with the SRY. Something will be epistatic to something else. And you're going to get a lot of infertility or a lot of dissexuality. And that's exactly the conditions under which you can separate two populations and speciate them. So if you come back in 6.8 million years, you might find no humans, or you might find several different species of humans, which could be a frightening prospect. We don't do all that terribly well with just one species. How are we going to cope with having several species that differ in their sex determination? So my conclusions are that uh, there's a lot of variation in the sex uh, chromos the sex determining pathways, in the hormone pathways, and in other genes elsewhere in the genome that control facets of mate preference and facets of uh, gender identity. And we need to know a lot more about those, uh, particularly in the present climate. Um, we know about SRY and we know how it controls the pathway, but we don't know enough about the pathway and there's continual new genes being discovered that moderate uh, some of these push me, pull you interactions. Uh, our sex chromosomes are actually rather young and they're probably still developing. Uh, the Y chromosome has almost degraded to death and it could be uh, loss, but don't worry because there are plenty of other sex genes out there that we could choose, uh, but there could be some problems in, uh, in going from one system to another system. And I hope you can see from, from this that going far away from humans is actually very informative. It's allowed us to look at a much broader definition of sex and sex determining pathways. And so I hope you'll see that, um, that we should have been funded by uh, the medical establishment for looking at platypuses and kangaroos after all. Uh, they weren't very friendly about that. And I want to just finish up uh, showing you some of the pictures of uh, people in my lab over many, many years uh, that have worked on platypuses or emus or snakes um, or uh, presently uh, the dragon lizard. Thank you.
Too much say um, questions. And I'm not sure if this microphone's working. Hello. Hi. Yeah, that was a very, very interesting. I love the talk. Um, I was curious. So I know obviously they branched off evolutionarily a lot earlier than um, like the animals you're looking at, but um, does sex differentiation in plants happen with like similar mechanisms? Have people looked into that or are there any like unique ways that plants do it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, it, so some plants have sex chromosomes. They, they're usually um, rather recently evolved plants. So it's, it's not very common in plants, but it's very parallel. Again, you'll get XY systems like humans or ZW systems like birds. And they seem to be doing it exactly the same way, reducing the Y chromosome, reducing the W chromosome. Um, there's a lot of theories of sex determination actually come from observations on plants, uh, but it's very parallel situation. Obviously different genes, different chromosomes, but parallel. So there, there are about 35 people in the, in the uh, um, viewing the lecture uh, from Zoom. And uh, so we'll also, so anybody who's, who's on Zoom who would like to ask a question, please. Write it in the chat. Are there any questions in the room here right now, Paul? So, um, box L two and, and the inhibition. Um, uh, is, is that a sex determining gene for uh, ovarian development, or just an inhibition of the testis development? Uh, I'm waiting for somebody to discover FOXL2 is female determining in some toad or other, but nobody has so far, but it would be a perfectly good way to make an ovary uh, if it were epistatic to making a testis. So I, I can see that it could well become sex determining. Nobody's discovered that yet, but I'm waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I learned in like high school biology that sort of the female embryo is sort of the standard and then only because of the SRY turns on. So the males are actually like the deviating uh, in a way. Would you say that's an old fashioned view based on what you just told us? Um, it's true in some ways, um, but uh, there's such a lot more going on. Uh, it's I, I think if you just leave it alone, you won't get an ovary. You need just as many genes to make an ovary as you do make a testis. But um, it's so much easier to study making a testis that I, I think the poor old ovary got left behind rather. Okay. Rhonda. Well, thank you. That was a fantastic, enlightening talk. Makes us think a lot, Make uh, makes us think a lot too kind of like you. <laughs> but um, my question is re with respect to the X chromosome uh, and how many genes are expressed in the brain. And you did highlight brain. Uh, as a neurologist, um, just can you speculate, uh, I guess, looking back or looking forward? So why do you, I mean, it's not like you're saying a bunch of heart genes are on the X gene or a bunch of kidney genes or toenail genes. You know, I'm just saying brain. And so can you say, first of all, I guess, speculate why you think that happened, the brain was selected for on X, those brain genes on X, and, and then moving forward, can you comment on the possibility that there's a huge effect of X genes on CNS uh, disorders? We know, we know of some of them, of course, but, um, you know, they, they just don't come, come up in the linkage analyses that are done, the GWAS stuff. They don't really look at X chromosome very much. They're starting to do that now, but you can really argue this is a huge under-investigated area for neurodegenerative diseases, right? I, I think that that's a wonderful question. Uh, and it's been answered uh, in very imaginative ways. Um, I think it's easy to see why there would be male reproductive genes on the X because the X is all by itself a single X in males and so any advantageous gene on the X will be immediately selected in males and so you would expect a bias to, towards male reproduction but that doesn't explain why intelligence genes get 
landed on the X, unless you say, well, intelligence might have been selected for in males by females. So maybe females uh, chose males who uh, were better mammoth hunters or clever, or maybe had time to paint on the cave walls and, um, and invent flutes and that sort of thing. And so there's a book by Jeffrey Miller, which I really found interesting where he wasn't talking about the X, but he was talking about um, female selection of intelligent males. So I think it, you know, it could be intelligence was a selected trait, um, particularly uh, sexual selection is very powerful. It's actually more rapid than natural selection. So uh, that could explain why our brains got so big so rapidly because it was sexually selected. A brain as an ornament, um, I don't see that it has to be an expensive ornament like a peacock's tail because actually having a, a brain is pretty useful practically, but I, I could see the argument you could make uh, as to females um, so selecting to mate for male with males who can provision them and actually entertain them. So there's a question from the chat from uh, from the Zoom audience, which is: Are there roles for non-coding regions of the DNA in sex, oh, deter in yes. sex determination? I, I think that's going to be uh, keep us busy for a few decades. There are, I think, thirteen something 13 or 17 non-coding RNAs that are transcribed from the Y chromosome. Um, and we know very little about them, uh, but at least one of them seems to have an effect, not on sex actually, but liver function. Strange. Uh, but I mean, all these non-coding um, DNA RNAs, and there's some micro RNAs as well, could well uh, feature in our uh, network of sex uh, sex differentiation. Um, and of course, the X chromosome, there's also many, many non-coding RNAs that are uh, encoded by, uh, that are transcribed from the X chromosome and would probably be dosage uh, related. So two copies in females and one copy in males, because a lot of them are not inactivated. So I think that's a whole, a whole new, uh, uh, field of investigation that is very, very young at present. So I'd like to pick up on that question and the question over here, which is, uh, so the old view of sexual differentiation is the females what happen when you, the females is what happens when you don't have a Y chromosome. And besides the irritation of defining females as not males um, and uh, as, uh, which is irritating, irritating to a, a bunch of women that I've met. Um, there's a, let me give, uh, give an example of um, something that has nothing to do with gonadal development, but has, has something to do with being female. And that, there's a gene that's expressed in every non uh, germline cell in the female body, and it's not expressed in any cell in the male body. Um, if you knock it out in a mouse, the, the female dies and the male doesn't die. Um, if you knock it out in adulthood in the in a mouse, um, all of the females get uh, a hematologic cancer, and none of the males get this cancer. So it's a required for embryonic survival in in mice and presumably also in humans, in females but not males. It protects from cancer in females, but not males. So it has a lot to do with making females different from males. And you know what this gene is. X exists. Yes, exists. <laughs> it's on the X chromosome. And it doesn't actually have a specific role in gonadal differentiation, but it but, uh, operates via a sex chromosome mechanism to make females different from males, okay? It also makes females more like males by shutting down one X chromosome. So both sexes have one active X chromosome in general, right? So it's a kind of a paradoxical gene, but there, there, females have things that make them different from males, just like males have things that make them different from females. And of course, this, this follows from the question of non-coding RNA. 
because exists is non-coding. It's a very lo long right. um, RNA, which does not make a protein product. And the really weird thing is the same thing happens in marsupials, but it's a different non-coding RNA. So I, I think there may be many non-coding RNAs that do things that we don't know about yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, fantastic, Jen uh, Jenny. We uh, really appreciate um, coming all this way and talking to us. And so thanks so much.